This is Bill Schultz, historical writer at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and I have with me today Dr. Mary Horowitz, class of 1980. Mary, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Well, let's get started. Tell me about your background. Where are you from? I was born and grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I'm the oldest of seven children. Mm. My father was a lawyer. My mother was a homemaker. And uh, I lived in Brooklyn until I went to college, and I haven't lived there since. Okay. And, and where did you do your undergrad? I started at uh, State Co University, uh, State College of New York in Buffalo. Um, I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted okay. to teach children with disabilities. Um, okay. And uh, I had done volunteer work in that area all my life. I had a brother who had who was mentally handicapped and mm -hmm. had a and uh, so, but the, I didn't, I grew up in a different era when the whole spectrum of what one could be wasn't really discussed at all. <laughs> my, in fact, my, my parents uh, were, when I changed my mind and decided I was going to go to medical school, I didn't really think about medical school until I went to college. And you're answering my next question, yeah. so I want to hear this. So when I went to college, um, I loved biology. I'd already always loved science. And I had a friend who was a graduate student, and he was explaining to me what he, his project in the lab. And I was asking him all sorts of questions because I found it fascinating. And he said, why are you going to be a teacher? You should be a doctor. And all of a sudden, it occurred to me I could be. And so that was about what year in college? That know? was my freshman year. Freshman year. So that's when you and decided. That's when I just that's when I decided that maybe I should think about other things. That's great. Uh, and I um, was in a special program where we did everything by independent study, mm -hmm. and I asked to do a project uh, in a lab. And so I spent a semester working at the University of Buffalo in a molecular biology lab. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And, but you know, I said all my life that I was going to be a teacher, so I said, well, maybe I should work in a classroom for a while. And the, the professor I was working with said, well, you know, my brother's a teacher, and I think you'd really like working with him, so why don't you spend a semester with him? I said, it was really an incredible opportunity to be in this program where I could do whatever I wanted, pretty much. Um, and I said, okay. She said, but he's in Milwaukee. Uh. And I said, that's fine. Um, you might want to edit this out, but being a New Yorker, I said, Milwaukee. Is that Wisconsin or Minnesota? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's OK. This is <laughs> the fun of doing this. Right. So I, I came to Milwaukee for a semester, okay. and I worked in, in this man's classroom. And she was right. I really liked him. And I had a good time, but I knew by the end that I was really wanted to do medicine. Mm -hmm. However, I married him. Oh, she. <laughs> and I moved to Milwaukee. This, this is a great start. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> so, um, so I left Buffalo and I came to Milwaukee and I finished my undergrad at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. Okay. And then now you're in Milwaukee, so that answers the question about why Medical College of Wisconsin. Did yes. you apply to other medical schools or was this it? I did apply to other medical schools, but I got an interview here right away mm -hmm. and I got accepted right away. So I withdrew all yeah. my other applications. I didn't interview any place else. Because I was pregnant with our first child, mm -hmm. so you know, the idea of moving and starting medical school mm -hmm. and starting a family all at the same time was more than I could um, imagine myself doing. That's great. That's a good story. <laughs> you know, actually, as, <coughs> that child's now 40 oh, years man. old. Wow. You and I'm still married. Oh, that's great. To the same person. That's great. No, that's a great, great story. Um, while at MCW, it's always fun to ask the question about some of your very memorable professors, good or bad, and if you've got any stories about them. <laughs> um, and okay, if, there are, if you say something that you don't want, I'll edit it out. You know, actually, I had wonderful professors. Mm -hmm. Any that you know, I started out? medical school with an eight-week-old baby mm -hmm. that I brought to freshman wow. dinner, to the freshman wow. dinner. And um, a, a lot of people have asked me whether I ever felt um, 
discriminated against or not supported. Because and, you had the a yeah, because I had a baby and I was married and I was a woman and you know only twenty five percent of the class at that time were were women. Mm -hmm. But I really felt like I was supported all the way along. Some people that were just wonderful. Um, Alan Mailer, who is the head of biochemistry, was very supportive. Uh, when I got into clinical rotations, uh, Charles Yunkerman, yeah, just fantastic. What a great guy. Great guy. Just a great guy and, you know, the kind of doctor that you would want to be. Um, and uh, Mike Keelan. Oh, great. another also great guy. Wonderful, yep. wonderful doctor. Yeah. I was on uh, service Thanksgiving um, as a second year resident. He was my attending and oh. he, he, brought in he brought in Thanksgiving oh, dinner for me. Oh, that's great. It was great. Because my, my family, I'd sent them off to my mother's, you know, because I wasn't going to be mm -hmm. home anyway, because those were the days when you were, you know, on all the time, mm -hmm. you know, on call all night, every, every third night, and there every single day, there were no days off. Mm -hmm. So um, it was crazy for them to hang around to have a half hour Thanksgiving yeah. dinner with me. So he brought, he felt bad for me, so he brought in Thanksgiving That's dinner. That's great. It was really nice. Um, you know, uh, Jim Serletti, who is oh, the dude. program director, yeah. I was scared of him, but I loved him anyway. Were these, were, were these uh, physicians you were running into once you were in your residency? You know, because I did all my clinical work here also, I yep. ran into them both sure. during my clinical years and, and during my residency. Yeah. Well, you've mentioned some great, great uh, they're, people. They're really fantastic people. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's super. No, that's, uh, that's great. Hey, let me ask you, would you like a little water? No, I'm okay. Okay, good. Um, you know, uh, we're moving right in. You did your residence in internal medicine mm -hmm. and then uh, a fellowship in, in hematology oncology. No, I didn't do it that way. Okay. That, see, that's, that that's what I deduced from my, yeah. my, my records that no, I have. No, I, I didn't do anything the way you're supposed to okay, do it. Okay, tell me how so, you did it. So, uh, first of all, I took a year off between my okay. internship and, and residency, between my first and second years, to have our second child. Mm. And, uh, of course, everyone told me, oh, you'll never go back, you'll never go back. And, of course, that was silly, because what else was I going to do? Right. Um, but I enjoyed my year off. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed having, having that time, um, and I enjoyed going back. And uh, then when I finished, I, I did a year as chief resident. Okay. And then I joined the um, general internal medicine division in the Department of Medicine. As a faculty member. As a faculty okay. member. And what I wanted to do was epidemiologic research, so I was working on a master's degree in biostatistics. Mm -hmm. And when I was um, looking for something to do my thesis on, my advisor, who was Al Rim, um, who was head of, of biostats at that time, suggested that I might want to work on the database being maintained by the International mm -hmm. Bone Marrow Transplant Registry, a big outcomes database. Uh, they. Um, they didn't have too many physicians who were who were graduate students, and you know they thought it would be easier for me to understand the mm -hmm. the medical part of it. So I said, sure, that'd be fine. So I started to do a project using their data, looking at differences among centers and in, in outcomes. Mm -hmm. And in the process, came ran into uh, my the person who was to become my professional mentor, really, which was Professor Mortimer, Mortimer Borton, who whose career really started as a nephrologist, and he was the scientific director of the IBMTR, the National Bone Marrow Transplant Registry. Uh, you know what's funny about these interviews? You guys are moving me right yeah, along. Right along your questions? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm going, you're going right to my next question, so. So yep. he taught me BMT. Well, that's he taught what, me about know, bone marrow transplantation. I wanted to ask you, you know, and I, I, you know something, I know of the center because of you, but the question is, you know, to tell us about Mortimer Borton and his contributions to mo bone marrow research. So, so I'll let you do that now. Yeah, so um, Mort was a nephrologist. That was his, his clinical work was in nephrology, but he was, he was a laboratory scientist, and an immunologist. And his work focused <coughs> on studying graft versus host disease mm -hmm. and graft versus leukemia reactions uh, in mice. Uh, and so, you know, with, when you transplant someone's bone marrow into another person, you're transplanting that person's immune system because our immune cells reside in our bone marrow. And those cells can recognize the recipient as foreign and set up a reaction mm -hmm. against the recipient. That's called graft-versus-host disease. 
And we have to match patients and donors carefully to, to minimize that risk, as well as give pretty powerful immune suppressive drugs, or else it can be fatal. Mm -hmm. But there's a beneficial effect of graft versus host disease because those immune cells can also recognize leukemia or other cancer cells as abnormal and exert a very powerful anti-cancer effect. And, and Mort's work was really in trying to differentiate the graft versus host versus the graft versus leukemia effect. And GVL, or graft versus leukemia, it's a term that's, that's part of the language of mm -hmm. bone marrow transplantation, but it was a term that he coined here. Yeah. And, and he did a lot of that, that mice work. He was also um, involved in one of the first successful bone marrow transplants uh, that was ever done in 1968 mm -hmm. in a young Milwaukee boy with uh, a, a congenital immune deficiency, you know, the boy in the bubble type disease. Mm -hmm. And um, he worked with, the, that transplant was not done in Milwaukee, but the patient was from Milwaukee, yeah. and Mort was involved in doing the HLA matching between the donors and donor and recipient. And um, he was also part of a group that decided that was invited to, to uh, start a branch of the NIH's organ transplant registry focused on bone marrow. Mm -hmm. So this was a very simple outcomes registry that was simply collecting the number of transplants that were being done and for what and whether patients lived or died. In 19, and that was in 1970. And, mm -hmm. and uh, in 1972, the government established the end-stage renal disease program that end-stage renal disease program took over the organ transplant mm -hmm. registry, but they were only interested in solid organ transplants, not in mm -hmm. bone marrow transplants. So Mort and a number of other pioneers in the field, including Don Thomas, who later got the Nobel Prize for his work in advancing bone mm -hmm. marrow transplantation as a, a clinical therapy, uh, decided to keep that outcomes registry going, add more details as a voluntary effort. And so, um, at that time, there were maybe 50 bone marrow transplants being done a mm -hmm. year in, in maybe uh, a dozen centers. Mm -hmm. um, but a few more joined each year, and Mort volunteered to keep the forms, the paper forms, mm -hmm. in his immunology lab. Wow. So it was just a file cap. The IBMTR got a name, International Bone Marrow Transplant Registry, was just a file cabinet mm -hmm. in his immunology lab. Wow. And every once in a while, they take out all the forms and they get a spreadsheet, the paper kind, not the Excel mm -hmm. kind, and, um, and write about first 50 transplants mm -hmm. for aplastic anemia, first 100 transplants for leukemia, wow. you know, and those were really landmark papers that showed that, that bone marrow transplantation could be successful in rescuing people with otherwise fatal blood diseases, both malignant yeah. and non-malignant. And did I read that uh, recently in, a, in a, the magazine, um, MCW magazine, that we're at about 450 locations now. 425,000 patients yeah, in that registry un now. Unbelievable. So when I was a graduate student and an early faculty member, it was 1985, and that's when I started working on the database, and we had a big party that year because the registry received its 1,000th case. That was also a very big year because it was the first year that the registry received its uh, big NIH mm -hmm. grant. And we still have that grant today. That's great. And um, that really um, allowed the research enterprise to go, but it was also a time when, when transplantation was taking off as a, a much more accepted therapy for blood cancers and, mm. and, and non-malignant blood disorders. So I came in right at the right time. That's great. You, you did. I you, did indeed. And, and I did indeed. You've lived at that the, time, really, the it was success. Great. No, that, and and so cool. I did my master's thesis on the on the transplant uh, registries data and and Mort and Al Rim, um, who the st statistical director said, "You're good at this," mm -hmm. and um, well, I think they said, "You have a knack for data." Oh, okay. I think that's what, that was the term that well, you that they it. used. You have a knack for data, and I loved it. Yeah. And, and said, "Well, instead of doing your research in general medicine." Mm -hmm. I had been doing some research in hepatitis vaccines and, and preventive care. He said, well, why don't you make your research in the registry of bone marrow transplantation? And I said, yes, I wanted to do that, but I wanted my clinical work to be the same as my research. So I, then I went back and did a fellowship 
mm -hmm. in oncology, really focusing on bone marrow transplantation. Well, you had your interest in research began before, it sounds yeah. like it began really before you even got into medical school, that you, that was a path that you enjoyed. I like research. Yeah. If, <laughs> what's funny, um, I really loved working in the lab. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought about being a PhD versus an MD, and I said, oh, I don't want to be a PhD because you always have to write all these papers and, and get grants. Yeah. So instead, I went to medical school, but then I stayed in research, so I still have to write all those papers and get yeah. grants. But you've but had great I have success to see with patients it. also, which I love. Do which Dr. I love clinical medicine. Dr. Borton, I, I did, is he still with us, or is no, he No, he, he died in 1990. Four. Was he still on our faculty at that time? Yes, he was still okay. on our faculty. That's right when I arrived, so that's probably why yeah. I didn't get a chance to meet him or know him. But what a boy, what an exciting story to learn about him. You know, within within uh, you know the work you've done, any other collaborators that you've had here at MCW that you'd like to mention? Well, in 1993, Al Rim left the college uh, to, to go to Case Western where he still teaches. Mm, that's He's great. In his 80s. That's I ran into him the other day. He's really quite remarkable. Um, and and uh, John Klein mm -hmm. uh, took his place as, as di director of the Division of Biostatistics. And John really took our data analyses to another level. So he was not only a great uh, analyzer of data, he was a methodologist. So mm -hmm. he, he really did a lot in terms of developing the statistical methodology that we now use and many others use for analysis of transplant data. And he was, he was a, a wonderful asset to the, to the IBMTR uh, until his death just a few years ago. Yeah, I, uh, I, did, I did not, I knew who he was and I, I was sad to yeah, I remember sitting we in my office sad. and literally seeing him walk by our alum, the alumni office windows, and it was a few days, it was that weekend, I think, yeah. that he passed. I'm sorry right. to hear that. I wish I would have gotten to know him. Um, you know, during your, your time at MCW, uh, you mentioned, you know, during your years as resident and uh, medical students, some physicians, any uh, other faculty that have served as mentors other than well, Dr. Well, Buzz Bort Cooper. Yeah, Buzz. Yeah, Buzz Cooper. So he, both when he was dean and um, also uh, when he stepped down mm -hmm. from the deanship, he became the director of the Health Policy Institute. And, and in that capacity, I reported directly to him because okay. the IBMTR was in the Health Policy Institute. Um, and uh, he was a great mentor. He was a great mentor. He challenged you to be your best. Made me cry more than once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I won't even, I won't tell you my first <laughs> sit down with Buzz Cooper, but it's almost like those ads where you see the speakers blowing you backwards, but then after he wasn't Dean anymore, he was, uh, he was uh, almost a friendlier guy. <laughs> well, you know, he was, um, like I said, he challenged you to be yeah. your best, and um, he was also, he, he had your back, you know, he was, he, he would, he would challenge you to your face, but when you weren't in the room, he'd be your staunchest defender. He sure seemed like an impressive guy. He was really you impressive You know, both here guy. and where he, after he left. Uh, sad that he, he passed also. Um, you know, during your time at the, the college, you've, you've dealt with a lot of residents, researchers, staff, and young faculty members uh, that you've probably mentored over the years. Are there some that you might want to mention and maybe some of their achievements here as well as, as elsewhere? Um, you know, we've had a, I've of course had my greatest opportunity to mentor people within the IBM TR, which is now the CIBM TR, which mm -hmm. is another story. Mm -hmm. um, That's my next question. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm very proud that a number of people who came for brief stays mm -hmm. have been, are still with us oh, okay. in very responsible positions. So, so Doug Rizzo, who came yep. to work with the, the CIBM TR, I don't know between 15 and 20 years ago from Johns Hopkins, is now the Cancer Service Line Director and of course holds one of our large grants, uh, large contracts with, with the government to analyze center-specific outcomes. Mary Epen, who came from the University mm -hmm. of Minnesota, is uh, internationally acknowledged for her work in analyzing cord blood transplants. Uh, Marcello Pasquini, who um, was only supposed to be here for a year mm. before he returned to Brazil to work with his father, who's the pioneer of bone marrow mm. transplantation in Latin America. 
uh, is still here. Wow. That's great. <laughs> and um, is really a, a key person in um, not only the CIBMTR, but the blood and marrow transplant clinical trials wow. network. Um, and some people have come and grown and, and gone, gone on to other things. Chris Bredesen came here from the University of Ottawa and now leads the University of Ottawa, mm. Ott went back and is now the uh, director of the University mm. of Ottawa transplant program. Ye uh, Jakob Passwig came from Basel, Switzerland, um, and, then, and is now the director of the mm. BMT program back in, in Basel. Wow. Neither one of them went directly back to their institutions, yeah. but ended up in leadership wow, positions. That's great. It, it, turning out uh, a lot of uh, leaders are, you know, yeah. taking the, the charge around the world. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Now, you mentioned, and it was the International uh, Bone Marrow Transplant Registry, and now it's the Center for right. International Bone Marrow Transplant Research. Blood and marrow transplant research because, well, of how, course, how now we that, don't only just use bone, bone marrow for transplants. We use blood, blood mm -hmm. collected either from veins or yeah, blood so the, collected yeah. from umbilical cord blood. Mm -hmm. So um, bone marrow was too restrictive. Mm -hmm. So but, it's the blood, uh, it's, it's the Center, Center for, for International Blood and Marrow ah, Transplant Research. Okay. My mistake there. Great. Right. It's, you know, it's too long a name and too well, long an was the change plot. Was the, the change to, to the center, was that related to expanding it? Yes. Okay. So in, um, so as I said, I joined in, in the IBMTR mm -hmm. in 1985. In 1987, um, the U.S. government established a, a bone marrow donor registry. So we are an outcomes registry. We collect data on the outcome of patients. But in 1987, um, as the use of donors other than family members was, was mm -hmm. beginning to be more accepted, um, there was the need to establish large panels of donors in order to try and find wow. a good match for, for a patient who needed it because there's many different tissue types in the population. So um, that bone marrow donor registry also set up an outcomes registry to track the outcomes of the, of the unrelated yeah. donor transplants it was facilitating. And um, that donor registry is located in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. um, and it's run by the National Marrow Donor Program, and it's now known as Be the Match, the mm -hmm. Be the Match Registry. So the National Marrow Donor Program, or NMDP, what did did, and the IBMTR over the years sometimes competed, sometimes collaborated. We came together in 2001 to become the coordinating center for the new National Clinical Trials in, in Blood and Marrow Transplantation, the BMT Clinical Trials Network, um, that is funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood mm -hmm. Institute and the National Cancer Institute. And in 2004, we decided to formally combine our research programs into a single research mm -hmm. program. And uh, we renamed the program the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Research, um, missing the opportunity for a shorter and easier to remember name. However, it's, uh, it's, I guess it says what it is. Uh, it says what it is, that's right. And the IBMTR had, had really become synonymous with clinical research in, mm -hmm. in transplantation, so everyone besides me was loath to give it up mm -hmm. at any rate. So we've been the CIBMTR since then. Um, the affiliation between the Medical College of Wisconsin and the NMDP has been incredibly successful. Mm -hmm. Um, we have very complementary types of expertise, but now we have a two-campus operation. So we have about um, 80 staff and faculty on this campus and about 100 uh, staff and faculty on the Minneapolis campus. Is that the University of Minnesota? No, it's the no. National Marrow Donor Program, okay. which is a nonprofit organization. Yeah. Well, that's neat. The, um, you know, the other thing that I, I know that your department works on uh, don't you put on like the largest conference yes. in the world for No, for it's not area? the largest in the world. No, there's, uh, a simil area. there's a similarly large conference in Europe. But oh, it's okay. the, we do the North American BMT meetings every year in collaboration with the American Society of Blood and Marrow Transplantation. And, but it's a and big meeting. And that's about 30, I think we had about 3,300 people last yeah. year. Yeah, I know, yeah. It's a, I know it's a big meeting. And it is It's a big been meeting. going on for quite a few it's years. It's about... Ninety-five. Wow, that's great. The you know your you know your career is amazing. Well, can you mention a a few of your proudest achievements, if you can narrow it down? 
Um, I'm proud of where the CIVMTR sits in terms of the transplant community. Mm -hmm. I view us as the ultimate facilitators mm -hmm. of, of good clinical research. Um, but I don't really view them as my achievements because, you know, that's one, one thing that Mort taught me early. She, he said, if you can't think we mm -hmm. instead of I, this is not the job for yeah, you. That's great. And uh, I always have tried to be true to that. And I, the CIBMTR works because of a lot of people. You have to remember there are hundreds of centers out there that with not enough mm -hmm. um, money from us mm -hmm. supply the data that makes our research possible. Um, and there are a hundred Oh, there are almost 200 people in the CIBMTR that work to make us successful. Mm -hmm. Additionally, we have lots of some of the world's best researchers that chair our committees and um, guide us in our scientific agenda. Yeah, I am proud of the CIBMTR. I'm, I'm proud of what we've accomplished. I don't view them as my personal mm -hmm. accomplishment. Um, I've been very lucky, very lucky. Uh, and. Uh, if I'm proud of anything, I'm proud of um, having had good people come and stay, and even the ones who leave have really good relationships that continue beyond. I, I think, you know, in, in my position, I have a very visible position, mm -hmm. you know, as, as the director, as the chief scientific director of the CIVMTR. So, you know, I get awards that really are recognition of the CIBMTR rather than me personally. Yeah. But the one award I'm really proud of is the, I did get from the American Society of Hematology in mm -hmm. 2010, the mentorship award, mm -hmm. the clinical mentorship award. And, and um, I'm proud of that. And that's very, that's very important to me. You know, it's interesting talking about, you're talking about the pride of people staying. Mm -hmm. you're the, uh, I recently uh, interviewed uh, Chris Schultz uh, oh, and, yeah. and new chair of uh, yeah. radiation oncology. He's, and, and he, he's a great guy. <laughs> he's and, wonderful. But he was, it's funny, the thing he was most proud of were all the faculty that are still, that have been there for so right. long. And right. I, I think that's great. That's, you know, uh, a neat accomplishment. And, and boy, congratulations to you for what, what you've done. Now let's take a look at, uh, real quick, at the Medical College of Wisconsin, kind of in a, in a bigger picture and get your thoughts. And you've been here your whole career for, for quite a few years. What do you see as some of the major challenges and opportunities for MCW in the future? Um, well, you know, the MCW is facing all the challenges that all academic institutions are changing. A, 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 you know, a, a climate in which there is um, competition, financial constraints, um, and, uh, you know, just a tough marketplace. Uh, and in that, and, and decreasing availability of federal grant funds. In that climate, um, I'm pretty proud of the fact that, that we've managed to hold our own. Um, it does make philanthropy really important mm -hmm. because uh, in that kind of climate, the centers that come out ahead are the mm -hmm. ones that have strong philanthropic support mm -hmm. to weather, to weather yeah. the storm, particularly in terms of supportive research. I think the other thing I'm really proud of, you know, I'm, I'm in addition to being the scientific director for the CIBMTR, I am the division chief for hematology and oncology mm -hmm. in the Department of Medicine. And I've been doing that for six and a half years. Not really because I wanted to, but a job I've, I've really enjoyed. Yeah. And I think that the other thing that, that is unique about us is that we are devoted to research, but we are really devoted to good clinical and humane care. I, I think that is an asset for us. Uh, I know every one of my faculty is focused on taking care of each patient as if they were their a family member, yeah. and and that will help us. Yeah. That's just what That's I heard this I'm morning. That's something I'm really proud of. That's just what I heard this morning at the gym. The young, really? the dad of the young man I mentioned, and he yeah. was very very complimentary of how his son is being treated here. And it's true. And it's yeah. not, I mean, you know, I, I suppose we have to say that for PR purposes, but yeah. of course you could just edit it out if I said something negative anyway, yeah. but it really is true. It's really important to us. And, uh, and we also are an institution um, that is collaborative, at least mm -hmm. in my, my world. Right. 
Um, you know, I, some academic institutions you don't you don't turn your back on anybody. Right. But that's not what the atmosphere is here. So I, I'm glad I ended up here. Yeah, um, we're glad you ended up here too. Yeah. And that it's it is funny. You're taking me right into oh, okay. my here next my next and and one of my last questions and. And you already mentioned you're uh, the chair of the hematologic uh, research. Uh, uh, you have the you have the chair. I have an endowed you have, chair, yeah. You have the Eline Endowed Chair in Hematologic Research. You mentioned Professor of Medicine and Chief of Hematology Oncology, Chief Scientific Director of the CIM. CIBMTR. Yep. I told you we should have made it shorter. Well, that's okay. I uh, you know I can edit myself there. Um, but you know, from a an, an alumnus standpoint, you know you've helped with all of your class of 1980 reunions. Uh, you served on the Alumni Association Board. Uh, to our good fortune, you were named Alumna of the Year in 2008. Why have you felt uh, it's been important to stay so active, involved as, I mean, a faculty member, as well as being an alumna of the, uh, of the institution? Well, why wouldn't I want to see all my friends? That, you know something? <laughs> I'm a reunion guy, yeah. as you know, and right. I love reunions. Yeah, I like going to them better than running them, but I love. <laughs> I'm sure yes. now you can really enjoy them. That's right? right, but no, I. But um, I don't know that I realized how important it was when I was a younger faculty member, but you know I'm 62, and when you get to a certain part of your life, you think about giving back. I and that sounds really corny, but it's really true. And um, I've spent my whole professional life here. It's been a wonderful place for me. Um, I, because I am on the faculty here, I understand how much that kind of support means, mm -hmm. how much it means yeah, for okay. both uh, the beginning investigator and the established investigator. As I said, the, the thing that really distinguishes the top, the top center, the most successful centers versus the the next tier is philanthropy, and uh, who better to support the medical college than the people who've been trained by That's the great. College. That's a great answer. One last question, how, you know, and, and you're the perfect person to answer answer this. How do you see medical education having changed from the time you were here, uh, you know, late '70s through the early '80s, to the students today? <laughs> um, well, you know, when I it was already starting to change. Now this is 40 years ago, you know, because it's 40 years ago this fall that I started medical school. And already um, people were starting to say less memorization, mm -hmm. more understanding concepts, more, more learning how to be a lifelong learner. Uh, of course, there's all the things that old people complain about, you know, we don't work the students as, or the residents as hard. Um, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, I'm not much in favor of treating medicine like shift work, but I don't think that people should have to be on call every third night Which and work you all the earlier. days in between. Yep. I don't think that that's a, a, a good, good treatment of anybody. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the issue now is there is no way you can learn everything. There is no right. way that you can master the body of medical information that is necessary to treat everyone who's going to walk into your clinic. And so you have to know how to get the information you need when you need it. And, and that requires thinking in a certain way. And I think that medical education is evolving to help people think that way. Mm -hmm. um, that is at a time when, uh, though, when the culture of today is that everybody has everything spoon-fed to them, you know, in terms of just looking everything up on Google. Mm -hmm. And that's different from knowing how to get the mm -hmm. information you need when you need it in a critical, in a critical way. So um, in, in, a, in a sense, you have to be even more, in, more inquisitive and more intellectual and more questioning to be a good doctor mm -hmm. now than before. And you've had a chance to observe the students over the years, so you would know. Yeah. That's they're, great. They're just, honestly, they're really just like we were. Mm -hmm. At the human level, these are all really bright people who are uh, a little driven mm -hmm. and uh, who are drawn, by and large, because they want to do, 
they want to they want to be in a profession that helps people. That's great. That hasn't changed. Nope. Well, Mary, thanks so much for joining me today. My thank, pleasure. Thank you.